to have you with us. And uh, uh, this is a, it, it's a bit of a follow up for me, uh, follow up for the conversation, for the congregation. Um, we've continued this journey of, of seeking to be an affirming, supportive community. And uh, we've continued to engage in conversation with with folks who who find themselves on the edges, displaced, trying to be a a, a community of care and, and and affirmation, and so these conversations are are part of that. So thank you for taking part in the conversation. Thank you for having me as part of it too. <laughs> so could you give us a real kind of quick <laughs> thumbnail sketch of of of, of who Corey is and where Corey came from? Sure, and, and if some people are like me, sometimes we can get forgetful too. So a little recap never hurts. Okay. Um, <laughs> my name's Corey, as you mentioned, and uh, for about 15 years now, I've been doing various LGBTQ and gender equity work. So I go around to schools, I go around to, to churches, I go to government organizations, public places, and we have conversations about gender identity. We have conversations about uh, sexual orientation, and, and we have very positive educating ones. Um, I'm a firm believer that ignorance is often not by choice. It's just from a lack of exposure and not knowing yet. And so going around and spreading awareness is, is something I've always had a passion for. Uh, professionally, I used to run residential homes for traumatized, abused, cognitively delayed, or youth that had been remanded into custody. And currently I teach at uh, Eastern College. I do the Child and Youth Care with Addictions Practitioner course. So we look a lot at advocacy and equity and the way that we can support our community. And uh, we talk not just about the LGBTQ and the trans communities, but a lot of other communities that can use our support as allies too. So I'm very lucky to have a job and a side hobby that both lean into my passions. And I was fortunate enough to come and speak with you in your congregation, as you remember back in April, 2018. And we had such a great conversation. I got to see Jenny and sing a song with her, which was just so nostalgic for me. Um, I still love that memory. And yeah, so, and, and we had positive conversations then. And I know you guys had big plans in place and I'm really excited to hear about how things have gone for you too. Well, yeah, as, as I indicated, Corey, the, shortly after that conversation, uh, the in June, June of that year, um, Sackville United Church was recognized in a, as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada. And, and that's not to say that we've arrived, but that we're intentionally on the journey uh, of seeking to be a safe, affirming place for for people in the LGBTQ uh, to community, and so uh, I think it was in September of that year. One of the first steps that we we took is we were uh, approached by some uh, queer youth and their parents, and they were looking for a safe place to gather. And so we took a room in the basement, and we said here this is yours and so f subsequently for almost a year and a half now um, we called it a safe space and the group of youth who started making use of the space uh, came to call it the queer room uh, <laughs> eight sometimes as many as a dozen youth hanging out down there on a Wednesday or a Friday afternoon and adults just present in the building to be a supportive and helpful uh, presence if needed they came up with their own code of conduct, and uh, I was really privileged to been really privileged to get to spend some time with some of these amazing kids. Uh, from that little group, they they uh, they organized the first gay cabaret in Sackville, um, <laughs> and uh, you know I, I like to think that we had some hand in in just allowing space for that creativity to to blossom. Uh, we've continued to be supportive of uh, of the Catalyst Group at Mount A, and, and we continue to try to educate ourselves. Um, like I said, being an affirming congregation no mean, by no means means that we've arrived, but that we're just continually, intentionally trying to deal with our own privilege, our own our own biases, and educate ourselves. And and so that's why we're back here having this conversation. 
I'm so glad. And there are so many wonderful buzzwords that I hear in your vocabulary, in your sentences. And I just, I love the positivity in there. And I really appreciate that. Boy. <laughs> what have you been up to since we last talked? I've been up to quite a bit. I've, uh, as I mentioned, I'm teaching now at the college. Uh, so I'm still able to stay connected with the youth and, and do placements and get out there in the community and do my advocacy work. But I have this new level of connection with students. So I've actually embarked on a new project and uh, we created a website and my students are working as volunteers with me. And it's going to be an, a digital and interactive resource center. There's going to be all sorts of different media. There's going to be connections to different community partners all around Atlantic Canada. Um, there's going to be, and there's currently some already up there, even though we're only fully launching on the 30th. And uh, we have some interviews and things, conversations like you and I are having, and some webinars that I've done before that are recorded and they're up there so people can benefit at large from these. And, and we can try to get that voice out there even further. And then we started a weekly YouTube series. And so we're putting out little 10 and 15 minute videos. They, they go live every Friday. So tomorrow we have another one premiering um, and from, from your and my perspective, I guess. Um, but from the congregations, you know, this coming Friday, there will be another. And they go live at 11 o'clock on our YouTube channel. But after the live premiere, they stay there. So they're visible on our website. They're right there on YouTube. And we're trying to create positive media so we're still connecting to people we're still educating we're still supporting and we're still creating inclusive mindsets we're still checking our privileges we're still doing all those things that we need to do even though we're living in a climate right now that might be a little bit more um sequestered sometimes we spend more time alone and we spend more time at home but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have an open mind it doesn't mean we shouldn't connect abroad you know these are still conversations to have so you know, we even started an Instagram page and a Facebook page because, you know, again, we, we can create these pieces of media and we can change the way people think about gender, about orientation and other people as well. So we've been supporting um, Joyce Eshaquan Esch struggles. We've been talking about different things to do with Indigenous things in some of our posts because we recognize that's a community we want to support and we want to, um, you know, be connected with. Um, we're also working with Take Back the Night and doing things relating to intimate partner violence and supporting women. So again, it's not just about connecting one group of people. It's realizing that to truly support the LGBTQ plus community, we need to support these other ones too. There's a lot of intersectionality and we need to better understand one another, even when we're more apart at times. Yeah, yeah. Can you say a little bit, of a, Corey, about why it is you believe this work is so important? Well, it's, it's because we're more on our own right now. Like right now, I'm sitting to you uh, having this conversation in my living room, and I still see my class every day, but a lot of times it's on a video from my home office upstairs. So in between those times, where are we? We're at home and we're alone. And it's very easy not to feel supported. And it's really easy not to feel connected. It's really easy not to have opportunity to learn and to grow and to continue our own personal development yeah. and there's a lot of pieces out there in our media that aren't all positive they're filled with bias and they're filled with opinions and sometimes even prejudice and hate and so at times when we could feel more alienated i think it's even more important to be generating media that is positive and it's educational and it's supportive and uplifting and connecting would it be your sense Corey, that the isolation that folk have experienced in this pandemic has been uh, significantly more acute for those in the LGBTQ community? I would. A, a couple of things that I'm aware of, I, I can only be so specific out of, um, re, you know, respect for confidentiality, but I know one student that back at the time when we would normally be celebrating Pride, this young individual was very upset because there was something called pride fall happening where people who were homophobic and transphobic were flooding the internet with the various posts that were offensive. And some of them were tagged with things that were supportive towards the community. So they would show up in, in other forms of, of people's searches. And they were basically trying to dampen that month at a time when people were feeling alone. And that's, that's dangerous for people's mental health. 
Um, I'm also aware right now a lot of our nurses in the schools have been redeployed to areas as frontline workers and, and necessity workers at a time when we need those nurses to do screenings and to help in our health authority. But then who's running our gay straight alliances and our support groups within the schools? So we see fewer active supports in our school systems and we have some students that go home and I know this for a fact from conversation and they're not fully out to their parents because they don't have that supportive environment there. And so where do they go when there's no support at home? There's no structure right now at school that's helping them. Where can they turn to? A lot of adolescents and teenagers these days at the very least have access to a phone. They might be able to hop on the internet. So maybe we can still give a little bit of hope and we can still be able to give a little bit of connection there. I'll tell you a little story, Corey. Of, of, it would have been, I think it was the fall of 2019, I was in the church and I was just pottering in the sanctuary and this uh, young woman walked in and uh, I said, can I help you? And she looked at me and said, no, I, I just want to say thank you. I said, thank you for what? She said, flying the trans flag and the pride flag. Um, I have a brother uh, who's gay and seeing those flags lets me know that this is a safe space for him. I think, and, and that was a pure, that was a really touching moment. Um, but other than fly flags, what advice would you give to us as we continue to, to try and be an affirming community, a safe place, a, a safe space for young people in our community? A any, any hard suggestions you give us? I, would, I do have a couple ideas. Um, one idea is just to be mindful of unconscious bias. You know, each one of us has a very unique perspective based on our experiences, the people that we've encountered, what we've seen, and we need to be aware of it. Sometimes we can mentally flip things and think about something in an opposite form and realize, does that seem weird to me? Um, something I did recently with my class is I had a picture of a male and a picture of a female, and there were stereotypical words beside them. And then we took a moment and we flipped those words and we had the opposite set of words by the image of the opposite gender. And I said, do some of these seem strange or out of place? And some people picked up on different words. Things like provider, you know, I had never really thought of a female as a provider before, but I took that for granted when I saw it beside a male. That's a little bit of a hint that we do have a personal bias or a personal perception about something. We all have them but we can be aware and we can be mindful. And the more so we are, the more inclusive we can be. Not about diversity, diversity is counting numbers. Inclusive is when our language supports everyone. It's when our actions are equitable to everybody. We give not everybody a pair of shoes, but a pair of shoes that fit them. Mm -hmm. And we do that through visibility. And we do that through mindful action. Little gestures go a long way. Um, I, you might have noticed in my name, I put Corey and then I put she and her because I was hoping to, to go back and bring that as a little reference. And I was so pleasantly impressed when I saw in your name, Lloyd, that you've done the same with your pronouns. That helps to normalize things and make people feel comfortable with identifying their pronouns. And that's more than just an image. That's an impact, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. So mindfulness and visibility, those are my two strong cues. When you see social media that's positive and educational, share it and make it visible to people. Do things that help to spread that. Uh, when you can think of things in a different light, when you can critically argue some of your biases and see them and change the way you engage with people, it makes a difference. Mm. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Thank you.